Oral history is a relatively new field within historical research that tends to privilege as much as is possible um, the voices of people who are not typically part of the historical record. So often people who come from communities that are perhaps uh, marginalized in different ways, um, as well as you know the voices of women, visible minorities, um, people who don't typically get to be part of sort of creating a, a formal historical archive. It's really a combination, first of all, of a very particular type of methodology or series of methodologies that privilege different kinds of interviews. You usually one-to-one, -one, but not always, um, where you sort of sit down with a person um, and you talk to them in different ways about their lives, about their experiences, about their perspectives on events or people that they have met or that they've been intimately involved with. Um, and then the other side as well, in addition to it being a methodology, it's also very much then about the outcome, this primary source that you are co-creating with another person as they go about telling you about their lives and the things that they've experienced. Um, the one that I've chosen, Animated Archive, um, is, is of my own coinage. Uh, I suppose in a sense what I take it to represent is three different things. Um, the first of them is, is memory work, generally speaking, so I'm interested in social memory and the way in which memory comes to be expressed and the forms in which it takes that expression. Secondly, I'm interested in, in archival research and archival research we kind of know as a, a generic type which is using sources and records from the past. Um, those can be textual but they can also be visual. And thirdly, I'm interested in, in landscape studies, broadly understood, um, and that probably speaks most clearly to my geographical background and training. But it's the bringing together of those three elements of, of memory work, of archival research and of landscape study that allow me to begin to imagine how archive might become something that is animated in the sense of uh, ventilated, that is to say taken out into the open air rather than being an indoor exercise or enterprise and mobilised too in the sense that it, it might become a thing that actually is, is on the move and there are creative opportunities that arise from thinking about archival work and archival conduct that actually are kinetic, energised somehow. The thing that we kind of agree is our common area of interest is, is living memory. That is to say, th things that can still take expression um, through different form, but are somehow still part of, of a living world. And so living memory remains, in, in the broadest terms, a kind of common interest for us. Do you agree, Erin? Mm. Oh, very much. I mean, it tends to be very much at the core of any kind of oral historical practice as well, because you're working with living narrators for the most part, or at least people who can speak in different ways to maybe memories that they've inherited as well through family, through friends, and so on. Um, often these memories have extreme meaning for people's lives. They, they resonate with them in very powerful ways. But do you want to tell us, Erin, what you think the, mm. broadly speaking, in principle, the benefits of oral history are? I think one of the things that oral history is often celebrated for is its ability to sort of get beyond official narratives of what's happened in a given time and in a given place. And certainly for the kind of work that I do where I'm often working in conflict or post-conflict settings where people have often been really, really polarized by recent experiences of genocide and war crimes and crimes against humanity, for example, there's often a tendency in the aftermath for, for governments, for the international community to want to kind of create and, and perhaps impose an official narrative of what's happened that restores peace, that tries to bring people back together that promotes reconciliation and justice, transitional justice and so on. But often what we, we see happening in these kinds of contexts is that these official narratives don't resonate very effectively with individual citizens on all sides of the conflict. Um, and as a result then that actually creates a lot of resentment, a lot of frustration and can actually lead then to the existence or the maintenance of these really powerful reservoirs of ethnic and political and, and different kinds of tensions that can help to keep the conflict simmering under the surface um, in these different settings. And I mean, oral history in this kind of setting then becomes a very provocative and at times quite ethically challenging endeavor. But I think at the same time when you can create space for these different kinds of narratives to sort of exist simultaneously to talk about the way in which these histories of conflict can be really complicated, the ways in which people can have completely different understandings of a given conflict or a given event, actually what you can find kind of comes out of that is some kind of common ground. People begin to sort of see that, you know, things are a lot more complicated and, and that 
that isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's something that needs to be reckoned with in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly for my work, I would argue that's one of the sort of main benefits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm kind of interested in um, a collagist approach, I suppose you could call it, where you, you bring lots of different things into correspondence with one another. Um, we all remember collages where you kind of piece lots of different colours and textures into one single form and in the process of doing so what you create is something that's hopefully more than the sum of its parts. I think that's really what I see as the benefits of an animated archive approach where there are a series of um, possible associations and relations which the researcher in effect kicks into life. Those associations might be between um, archived photographs, they might be involving domestic or household objects, they clearly involve a remembering individual and perhaps they also draw in and encompass a, a, a lived and felt world of, of the landscape in which that life has been lived out. And it's that set of associations and possible relations that I understand to be beneficial, but all of it speaks back to that appeal of, of collagist practice actually. Erin, do you want to reflect on limitations as you mm. understand them for the oral historian? <laughs> Where to begin? <laughs> um, in most instances we tend to, to look at it as a very sort of beneficial practice. Um, certainly with oral history broadly speaking, the general sense is that you know we're building these really positive long-term relationships with people, with communities, um, that we're trying to sort of over time get a sense of how these people understand their lives, how they make sense of the past, um, how they've been affected by the past and, and you know how they're sort of trying to make sense of these things in the present. And of course then this issue of memory and what people are capable of remembering given their life experiences, given their emotional state at the moment when a memory was being created in their minds, how they react to you as the interviewer, um, how you're reacting to them as the interviewee. All of these things can shape the content and the form and the sort of meaning that comes out of the interview as well. How do you train yourself to listen? Oh goodness, a lot of hard work <laughs> I would say. I mean certainly an art form, certainly a skill I would say as well. I, I think it actually takes a lot of hard work and, and training and discipline to be an effective listener, um, especially when you're working with stories that are maybe difficult to hear or difficult to witness. I've, I've always tended to be a more quiet person anyways. Um, I'm generally the person who will sit back and just listen to what people say in, in any kind of setting rather than being really you know, overtly talkative myself. But little things like learning to kind of show that you're listening non-verbally, typically because I have an audio recorder and I'm going to be transcribing. I don't want to be interrupting what's being said all the time with a lot of mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. You know, training yourself to listen and, and show that you're listening in ways that aren't going to be picked up on an audio recorder that will be culturally appropriate. Some people find sustained eye contact really off-putting and so if you're staring them down um, in the context of an interview, that can actually cause them to become uncomfortable. But I mean, in your research as well, especially when you bring in the spatial dynamics and so on, it must be an element that you struggle with too. I hope I listen. Um, I was quite taken by your phrase there about you know an, an effort to, to decenter yourself from from mm. the proceedings, and if you'll allow, I'll actually probably I'd rub up against that actually, mm -hmm. and, and and increasingly in lots of bits of work that I've published, I quite intentionally leave myself in as an active presence in a narrative, rather than in effect figuring myself as outside. And so I leave myself as, as someone in the midst of the practice and that runs contrary to so many social science traditions and conventions and orthodoxies where in effect the researcher writes away from themselves. What I'm not really talking about either though is a kind of reflexive turn version of myself where I come clean on who I am according to a kind of indices of social identifiers. Instead it's an effort to have a version of myself present in the work. I find greater satisfaction and contentment and to a degree, honesty, whatever that is, in still having myself as an active presence in the narrative account. Now, there's a whole lot of cute moves and forms of literary artifice that can go on in terms of what version of yourself you allow in. But I still like the fact that there is an authorial presence and an authorial voice who's also an embodied person who's actually part of 
that account of the world. It's difficult to properly explain how that plays itself out in writing and sometimes it differs according to the project and according to, to the animated archive exercise that I'm involved in. In many senses I only know what it will be according to the way in which a project unfolds and the type of relationship that's struck up with a person or persons and a place. But I'm always looking for the opportunity to retain something of myself as a presence within the scene, within the situation, within the landscape, within the relation. That can potentially be read as self-centred, it can potentially be read as in comes I, where the very last thing that should happen is for the authorial voice and presence to be centred. I'd like to think it's just kind of recessed or, or oblique to the action there but just set off to the side. That's kind of where I see my work heading, which I think is different from an oral history tradition. Yes and no. Oral historians pay a lot of attention to subjectivities of themselves, the mm -hmm. subjectivity of, of the people that they speak to, and, and then those coming together, which is kind of the intersubjectivity. And we certainly will position ourselves within our research. We'll spend a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, biases we might have that prompt us to ask some research questions but not others, for example, or or that could potentially impact the relationship that we have with people. And so if I were conducting an interview with somebody and the questions, you know, that I was asking were really difficult and then responses I was getting were really monosyllabic, for example, that might be an instance where I would actually write myself into the interview and try to kind of unpack why it is that the interview went that way rather than more like a conversation or rather more like, say, a formal interview. And certainly after the interview as well, quite often what we'll do, oral historians are big on kind of keeping journals and taking notes around not just the interview itself, but the whole encounter that we have within our research. And quite often we'll also then reflect on, you know, the casual conversations that we have with people, you know, when we want to, say, recruit them. Like we'll quite often bring ourselves into it in that way as well. But I think it's just in the moment of the actual interview, particularly if it's, say, something like a life history interview, where it really we want it to be led by the interviewee as much as is possible. I think that's more where we, we try to kind of step away and mm -hmm. we often talk about it in terms of um, a shared or a sharing of authority. We, we see ourselves as co-creating these interviews, you know, and these sources. We, we bring a certain expertise into the room by virtue of our training and so on, but we also try to recognize the expertise of the person who's lived their life and knows what they've experienced and in different ways is also then bringing that kind of authority into the room. So, you know, when it comes to that kind of process of sharing authority, yeah, we will maybe decenter ourselves a bit, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that we're not positioning ourselves within the research, if that makes sense. Sure. My own reflections on, on limitations in the form, there's still a responsibility, um, however creative an enterprise one's entering into when it comes to a combination or, or recombination, to actually think through the exercise of association and relation to try and ensure that you're still working with a version of fidelity that speaks back to that social memory. And here what we probably get towards is the role of narrative as, as another kind of commonality in our, in our practice. We both of us are, are mindful methodologically from the very outset and that's to say that narrative isn't something that is only considered or configured as, a, as an end point, um, as that classic kind of writing up episode in, in the kind of orthodoxy of, of the model of research design. But there's a, an awareness of, of narrative operating at the beginnings of methodological design and then at every point thereafter. And so narrative becomes a kind of concern that actually shapes the conducting of research. Because it, it, it's not to say that any narrative is prefigured, but there are possible narratives and there's a, an attentiveness to narrative that's always operating. As an oral historian, Erin is continually reading people. She's reading <laughs> me right now. <laughs> Uh, for, for certain narrative forms. So, so, so for me, I, I think there's, there's, there's great creative possibility in, in a critical engagement with narrative form right from the beginning. But Erin, you should tell us about how, how narrative works for you. 
often when, when oral historians are thinking about narrative, we're actually thinking about a whole lot of other things that are happening in the room or before the interview begins, as the interview is going on, once the interview is over. And, and we'll tend to kind of look at that all in tandem to sort of get a sense then of not just the words that are being spoken and the meaning those are intended to convey, but also the meaning that these other nonverbal forms of communication are, are telling us about either the person we're, we're talking to or perhaps the broader meaning that they want us to take away from that encounter. So yeah, narrative can also involve a lot more than just reconstructing history. And indeed, I think most oral historians nowadays have kind of shifted away from that sort of reconstructive style of narrative analysis to really focus on the deeper meaning behind the words, the messages that people are wanting to convey. And at the end of the day, you know, we're really interested in what people hold to be psychologically true or psychologically meaningful for them. Um, that might mean then that there's very little that we could see in that narrative that might be historically accurate, right? They might be getting names and dates wrong, but we'll look in those instances at why they've constructed the memory in that way and the deeper meaning behind that, what it tells us about the meaning that the past has for them in that moment, rather than simply dismissing it as, oh, that's untrue or that's, that's inaccurate. We'll try to focus and tease out the psychological truth behind what these people are, are saying to us and that involves then taking into consideration not just the words but body language and how the story is constructed for example. In effect what, what we're talking about there is a movement from from private history to public history mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and in describing it through an act of will or evasion you've avoided using the word impact. Um, but <laughs> yeah. I did. <laughs> but, but yeah. By the currency of contemporary academia, that's what we're talking about there, mm. is perhaps uh, oral history work or perhaps animated archive work can, can have some kind of impact dimension mm -hmm. to them. And I think there is a huge world of potential there in the sense that commitment to ordinary experience, uh, perhaps experience not previously spotlighted and the narrative form that it can take means that it ought to actually have some expression that fires the public imagination too, or the popular imagination too. It's been fascinating to hear your, your discussion as producers of oral histories, but I'm on the other end as a consumer, and I mm -hmm. come to these perhaps years or even decades later, and I was wondering if you could sort of enlighten me as to some of the particular challenges of interpreting oral history. I, I usually try to take a triangulation approach where I find other documentary sources and I'm trying to um, sort of visualize an appropriate approach for, for somebody who's really quite external to the process of collecting and, and disseminating the yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Nowadays, with the internet, we have so many resources at our fingertips. And it's, I think, a really important question because, you know, anybody can go about creating a website, for example, or doing their own little oral history project, which on one hand is, is excellent because it means, again, you've got more people speaking about their lives in their own terms. But it can also sometimes be a little bit of a challenge as well because figuring out which which sort of accounts are not necessarily true or not, but certainly which accounts are maybe, how do you frame it, like accurate in, in the sense of, you know, not being overtly politicized in a way that's potentially, you know, a bit reprehensible, for example. Um, certainly in the field that I that I deal with is, is a real challenge because I teach courses on genocide, for example, in the 20th century or um, courses on Rwanda explicitly. You know, I have to spend a lot of time with my students talking about considering the source of their information. Um, mm -hmm. I don't mind if they want to use blogs. I don't mind if they want to find, you know, community-based oral history projects. I encourage them to. But, you know, use this word triangulation um, and trying to kind of then compare it with all these different materials, um, I would say is absolutely essential. But also, I think, looking at it maybe from the perspective of what is the person trying to communicate with this, with this narrative or whatever it is they're putting out into the world? What is the purpose behind it? And sometimes it's relatively easy to figure it out. You know, they speak in a very clear way where the agenda is right up front and center. And other times it's a bit more difficult to figure out. But I, th I think even just being mindful of what that sort of agenda behind it might be, what you know, how they're maybe trying to shape discourse on that particular event or that particular person, how they're maybe attempting to bring themselves into the story, right? All of that can go into kind of considering and contextualizing the source. And I would say that would need to be a, certainly a big part of it. Because, um, yeah, there is, there is just so much information available today. So. Much of what you talked about was verbal. So I wondered if there was any other way of kind of capturing your material. Do you use um, visual methods? Mm -hmm. um, and if you could maybe talk about those a little bit. Yes, I use photographs, partly with a view to thinking how they might ultimately become part of some, an illustrative element of some written output. Uh, but they're also a kind of in-process aid memoir. The documentation of a site and life in a site um, becomes its own 
kind of archive. Um, and so there's a, an effort to actually um, produce a kind of sedimentation of material that I can then revisit as an exercise of recalling particular episodes or particular moments, particular days, particular encounters. And certainly um, photographs serve that function. Um, they're also a really effective way to actually enter into the exercise of writing, um, and that is to, 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 to write through a photograph, rather than to find the photograph subsequently as the supplement to the already existing bit of writing. In a sense, that auto-archiving impulse to photograph, 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 and then spend time with the photographs rather than have them just sitting lodged on a hard drive, which we tend to do an awful lot of the time with research, but actually spending time not so much systematically, but rather more in a sustained fashion, actually look hard at the visual and then look again and look again and look again. So that would be the approach that I would take, which is kind of non-textual and, and in effect is about embedding the visual into the enterprise of research all the way through.